a couple of more things done before I uh, parachute in. So I'm very, very grateful for the invitation uh, by Don and uh, to be able to be present with you today. Um, I, I selected that title because a year ago, the Father General of the Jesuit Order, uh, whose residence is in Rome and actually the headquarters of the Jesuits while it is at the Jesu, which is in downtown Rome, uh, the offices actually uh, of the um, of the Father General actually are just on the they're just right inside St. Peter's Square at a building that is absolutely adjacent uh, to St. Peter's Square and um, just on the border of the Vatican. And he himself declared publicly and in print, which I read that Satan is a metaphor. And um, if I were the Holy Father, I would have fired him on the spot. So I, I think that that's a very good place to start. And I know some of you may have heard uh, my talk in the past, or if you've gone on YouTube, I've certainly given a lot of you, a lot of the interviews that, uh, that have been recorded, uh, not by me, but by others. Uh, the Ministry of Deliverance and Exorcism is a ministry of healing. And uh, if you could excuse me for just one moment because I forgot to bring my Bible, I wanna read something to you kind of, as a, um, kind of as the platform to start the meeting. One second. And I want to take you to the, I want to take you to the fifth chapter of St. Mark. And this, in a sense, this will give you a flavor of what a formal exorcism is like, although I'm not going to go into a lot of minutia about what happens in an exorcism. I want to do something that's kind of more of a, at a high level and then allow some time for questions and answers. This is from the fifth chapter of Mark. Now, just so you're aware, there's a lot of places in Mark and Matthew where clearly Jesus performs exorcisms. They reached the country of the Gerasenes, which is in Gentile territory, by the way, on the other side of the lake. And no sooner had he left the boat than a man with an unclean spirit came out from the tombs toward him. The man lived in the tombs and no one could secure him anymore, even with a chain, because he had often been secured with fetters and chains, but had snapped the chains and broken the fetters, and no, and no one had the strength to control him. All night and all day among the tombs and in the mountains, he would howl and gash himself with stones. Catching sight of Jesus from a distance, he ran up and fell at his feet and, feet and shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? Swear by God you will not torment me. For Jesus had been saying to him, come out of the man, unclean spirit. What is your name? Jesus asked. My name is Legion, he answered, for there are many of us. And he begged him earnestly not to send them out of the district. Now there was there on the mountainside a great herd of pigs feeding, and the unclean spirits begged him, send us to the pigs and let us go into them. So Jesus gave them leave. With that, the unclean spirits came out and went into the pigs in the herd of about 200,000, pardon me, about 2,000 pigs charged down the cliff into the lake, and there they were drowned. The swineherds ran off and told their story in the town and in the country around them, and the people came to see what had really happened. They came to Jesus and saw the demoniac sitting there clothed and in his full senses, the very man who had been the legion in him before and they were afraid. And those who had witnessed it reported what had happened to the demoniac and what had become of the pigs. Then they began to implore Jesus to leave the neighborhood. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed begged to be allowed to stay with Jesus. Jesus would not allow him, but said to him, go home to your people and tell them that the Lord in his mercy, what the Lord in his mercy has done for you. So the man went off and proceeded to spread throughout the Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him and everyone was amazed. Now, there are many elements in that story 
that account that happened during an exorcism. First of all, what happens oftentimes in this healing ministry. So I want to reinforce, this is a healing ministry. And Jesus largely had two main aspects to his public ministry, teaching and healing. So this is a healing ministry. And I want to emphasize that because it takes some of the drama out of what our images are of this ministry that we find mostly on Hollywood screens or in movie screens from Hollywood. Yes, there is drama, no question about it at times. But this exorcism account that I just read from very much brings some of the elements that I was wanted to shed some light on today. So the man is in the tombs and in the mountains. So Satan always likes to isolate because he's looking for people who have broken relationships or no relationships. So where does Jesus find this man in the tombs? Now it's fascinating that Jesus went to the tombs because he had to have had some sense that he was going to find someone or someones there. The man could not be restrained with, with the chains. That's one of the, uh, that's, that's one of the aspects, one of the six signs that would be a sign of a demonic condition, would be inordinate strength that the person doesn't normally possess. And then Jesus says to him, what is your name, which is part of the formal rite. And the man responds, legion is my name, there are many of us. Well, obviously this wasn't the man. <laughs> This was the gang, which is what a collection of demons are called. They're called a gang. Legion is a collective term. And uh, in, a, in a Roman legion cohort, I cannot recall the exact number, but I believe it's 720 in a legion. Um, and so it's a collective term that would refer in, in terms of something of a military nature to a collection of soldiers, but it also refers to a collection of demons. And so the fact that Jesus calls the, calls the demon out by name and the demons recognize him even before, and they would because they would recognize the divine in the same way that I'm the mandated exorcist of the Diocese of San Jose, they recognize my authority. And that authority has actually been given to me by the local bishop because the ministry of exorcism really is a ministry by right of the ordination of the bishop, not the priest. The priest, me, I am given the authority because of the apostolic authority of the bishop and the demons recognize that apostolic authority. So the people that come to me, they're all suffering. That's one of the reasons why this is a healing ministry, not just because of the, the liberation that takes place, but people don't, they don't seek out an exorcist for any, just for any reason. They seek out an exorcist for spiritual liberation mostly but they're all suffering. Now, they may not necessarily, they may believe that what they're suffering from is demonic. Part of my role is to get to the root cause of what they're suffering from. And so I get calls, I even had calls today and on emails from last night. I need an exorcism. I don't do them on request. There's a protocol and it's in the right of uh, the rite of exorcism that the church has published since 1614 with revisions in 1998 and 2004. So there has to be a discernment and the discernment is necessary to determine is this person suffering from a demonic condition or a mental condition or some kind of physical condition or a combination of the three. So when we get a call and they're from the local church, we send an intake, my team sends an intake questionnaire that largely asks about 
background from childhood, um, reasons for being contacted, and we list a whole variety of what we call doorways, activities that people may have found themselves involved in, the occult, the new age, drugs, other addictions um, that could serve as uh, doorways. Uh, other kinds of uh, meditation, Buddhist meditation, Hindu meditation, Eastern meditation that could be suspect. And so all of that has to be looked at as part of the protocol. There's also a psychological evaluation that we oftentimes will have, have people go under, uh, undergo uh, as part of the process, even before they see me or while they're seeing me. Because again, we have to rule out the natural before we go to the supernatural. I have a team. I have actually two teams. I have a prayer team that meets with me for every one of our deliverance or exorcism sessions. Deliverance is a form of exorcism. They're really called minor exorcisms. Deliverances are not the recognized ritual that people tend to be most conscious of, but they are um, prayers that are addressed to God in which we ask God to do the delivering as opposed to in the formal rite where there are prayers first addressed to God and then there are prayers then addressed to Satan. In deliverance, the prayers are addressed just to God. And so you never ever start out with a formal exorcism. You start out after you've gotten the information together and if there is no psychological alarm bells, the, the psychologist or psychiatrist, mostly psychologists, their role, and we have three on our team, we have a medical doctor, we have several psychologists, one of who's bilingual, several psychiatrists, one of whom is bilingual, and sort of then a, an ad hoc group of other experts whom we may call on from time to time. Their role is not to tell us whether or not there's something demonic. Their role is to tell us, is there something of a mental nature that could be the prime reason or the root cause of the person's suffering? So that's all part of the discernment. If it turns out that there is no mental issue that can be identified, then we would then assume that what the person is suffering from uh, is of a spiritual, possibly demonic nature, but I always like to reserve those kinds of judgments until we actually begin prayer. And so deliverance prayers, in a sense, are part of the hierarchy and the protocol. Um, if a person is Catholic, one of the questions you would ask would be, are you a practicing, worshiping Catholic? If you're not, the prescription, the spiritual prescription we give to everyone is daily prayer, weekly Eucharist, monthly confession. That's, a, that's sort of a basic prescription. And then we would do pray, deliverance prayer, in part to see whether or not, as part of the discernment, does this reveal anything demonic? Are any of the signs exhibited? so that we can then move forward and listening for the doorways, what we do is we have the person reject, renounce, and rebuke those actions from their past that may have been the doorway that served as the engine to give the demon or demons the legal right to be attached. And then we have that we sever the ties between all of those actions and the person. Then we de determine if there's any other entities that are still present. And usually once you have the rejections, rebukings and renouncings and you sever the ties, then you can cast the demons if there are demons present. And we have discerners on our team who actually are able to discern if there are demons. Sometimes the demons will hide. 
And so they don't always necessarily immediately show themselves. But the weaker the demons, the more likely they are to be agitated by, by the deliverance prayers, which means that prayer does have a kind of what we call efficaciousness or power. And think of, when you think of your Catholicity, you just celebrated Mass. I celebrated Mass this morning. You just celebrated Mass together. And the prayer are prayers of the church to the Father, through the Son, and in the Holy Spirit. The demonic operate in a completely 180 degree reverse order, which is why in a satanic mass, the crucifixes would be hanging upside down. And they would um, abuse the stolen Eucharist and perform sexual orgies in front of it and maybe do other kinds of abuses. Because as the church operates, Satan operates in a complete reversal. So the discernment is hugely important because if you do know discernment and a team is very essential, both a professional team and a prayer team, the professional team is there because you need to rely on experts to help tease out what is the root cause. The prayer team is essential because during a deliverance session or a formal rite a session, you've got multiple people present who are praying with me. They're not praying the ritual with me, but they're praying with me. And they're also observing the client or the subject of the per, uh, they're, they're, they're observing the subject who is the, the source of the suffering. And the actual source who's perpetrating the suffering are the demons or other entities. So there's the doorways oftentimes, like lots and lots of people today are finding themselves attracted to the occult and to the new age more than at least any time that I'm aware of in recent history. When John Paul II wrote that letter in 2004 to Cardinal Ratzinger instructing every bishop in the world to select a priest to train them to be an exorcist, it was because of the the growing amount of occult practices that were taking place in Europe, which really now have spread all over the world. So it's, it, is, it is not all at all unusual to meet people who are um, practitioners of um, Wicca, uh, witchcraft, um, certain kinds of meditations such as Reiki, uh, there's people that are called Reiki masters, um, people who use yoga not as a form of exercise, but as a form of enlightenment. Um, people who would go to a medium or a psychic. We have, even in our own town of Saratoga, we have a place down the street about two miles from here. Psychic readings. That's not at all unusual. Uh, or people who will consult with a medium. Uh, about some matters having to do with um, what's going what's to happen in my future or attending a seance because they want to contact a loved one because there was unfinished business or they just want to know how they are or where they went instead of relying on faith and the tradition of the church. Um, so you have all of those and, and many more. I could tell you stories all day long, but we really don't have the time for that today. I will give you one little story in a while about something that's going on in another country involving what's called syncretism, which is the blending together of religious, different religions and their rituals and the dangers of doing that. So once you assemble the the discernment or the intake, and you make certain judgments, you look for the signs. So when the person comes, um, there are six classic signs of the demonic condition. One I just cited in the demoniac's case, the inordinate strength. 
Another would be an aversion to the sacred, which also was found in that demoniac, uh, the case of Jesus. Why? Because they were afraid. What have you to do with me? Have you come to destroy us? There's an aversion to the sacred. There's an acknowledgement of the divine in the presence of the demoniac through the demons. Um, another, so if you walk into a church, for example, and you, you feel ill for no apparent reason, or a person can't look at the crucifix, they, their, their eyes roll, and they only see the whites of their eyes. Um, or um, a person during the consecration feels irrational fear for no apparent reason. Or when they go to receive the Eucharist, and this has happened on one occasion, there is an odor that is so odious that the person has a hard time receiving. Or the person receives the Eucharist and they have a burning sensation as they receive it. Or they bless themselves with holy water and they have a burning sensation. Those are all signs of a demonic attachment or a demonic condition. Uh, another sign would be um, uh, speaking in a language they have no competency and this usually happens during a deliverance or an exorcism, formal exorcism session. Or the person just begins speaking Spanish or speaking Latin or speaking uh, what might appear to be Russian or some other Korean. I had a situation once where a woman who never w was Korean by ethnicity but born in the United States began speaking Korean. She had no, and she knew no Korean. Uh, another sign would be the demons during an, a session would, would tell you certain things about yourself. They can't read minds, but they could tell you things about yourself that nobody would know. Uh, another sign would be foaming at the mouth. And this would be not something that appears to be like shaving cream, but during deliverance, there is a kind of a coughing that takes place, which I'll talk about when I share this story with you of somebody I recently exercised. Uh, did deliverance with over Zoom in another country from here. But the kinds of, of, of foam is, is sputum, but it's of a very unique quality and appearance. It's incredibly viscous. It's very, very thick. And it's very, very white. And it doesn't look like anything that would normally be if one had a, the common cold, for example. Then finally, the last one would be um, epileptic-like seizures of the face and the limbs. And this can happen either during prayer. It could happen if somebody walked into the office to meet with me about a condition that they believed they had where they would, the demonic would fall on the floor. The person would fall on the floor caused by the demon or demons because out of acknowledging my authority because of my priesthood, and also maybe because I'm the exorcist of the diocese. So those are the six signs that I and the team look for in, in the discernment. And the, some of it would be happening during prayer, some of it would be happening before prayer. And so, this does, does it when people say, you know, I need an exorcism. It isn't like just going to the hospital or to the ER and getting a, a shot, you know, and then you're okay for tetanus or something. Um, this is a very uh, intense ministry. This is a ministry that is very um, emotionally draining. Uh, this is a ministry that is transformational, not only for me, but for the client and for the team. Because when the person is liberated, what happens in through the whole period of sessions, and usually this doesn't happen in one session, it's usually at least a number of sessions. It depends. In some, it depends partly on the techniques that are used. Um, there is the ritual, of course, but in deliverance ministry and even the ritual, um, there really is not a, what I would call orthodox, deliverance. I mean, you have the ritual, which gives you a framework, but when the demonic begin acting out, um, then you have to stop and you have to look and see what's going on. You have to consult 
with the team. They may have picked up something or seen something you haven't seen. When we do deliverances and exorcisms, of course, right now we're in COVID. So we've just begun doing deliverances outside in a very private area on the parish property. Um, and we've all kept six feet distancing. We've all wore masks. We all sanitize. Uh, all that has happened. There's a protocol of prayers that we pray before we begin the session. Everybody's anointed with oil, blessed oil before the session. Um, and then when normally when we're in the church, we have a, um, a whiteboard that somebody from the team is taking notes on that we can then refer to because very, very often there's a lot of fluidity going on and we can't all remember or recall all that's happening. What have we seen? You know, what, what um, did we get a name? All that's written. Now we've got somebody doing that on paper now in the, as opposed to the, the board only because we don't, where we're meeting, we don't, have, we don't have the liberty of the kind of space that we're used to. So um, all of that is very, very helpful because this ministry is a collaborative ministry and it involves lay people as well as the priests. And a priest should never perform the rite of exorcism or even do deliverance alone. It's too dangerous. Um, I've had one situation where I was accused of wrongdoing by someone we prayed over for a period of a year but she was sexually harassing another priest. And so because she wouldn't stop that, I, had, I was forced to sever the professional relationship with her, which then prompted her to go and make accusations of me. However, the accusations that she made were refuted because I had 10 people present. And the very things that she accused me of couldn't have happened, A, because they didn't, but B, I had 10 witnesses present. So, the, the value of the team is that at times um, there may need to be some restraining. We try and minimally restrain and during COVID there's no restraining. And that's why it's a little bit risky. But so far we've been able to, um, to, to uh, conduct these deliverance sessions uh, with safety, um, with precision and with success. Before a person undergoes a session of deliverance, at least the first time, or a formal exorcism, they have to sign a waiver, uh, what they call we call the liability waiver, which then takes the onus of responsibility off the diocese. If anything should happen, the diocese is not responsible. We've had our general counsel look at this, and we've also had um, uh, we've also had other lawyers from other dioceses look at this uh, to make sure that we protect the diocese. Uh, because again, we're dealing with a vulnerable adult or if we're dealing with a minor, for example, we would always have a parent present during the session um, for the sake of the minor, as well as for the sake of me and the team. Um, and that way, you know, it's all very, very transparent. So, um, Every single case is unique. And I'm going to share with you a case that I recently dealt with, which was something I never dealt with before, just as an example. I mean, we get lots of cases where people have opened a lot of doors. 80% of the people who come to me are sexual abuse victims, which is a soul wound. So very, very often, it's the soul wound that creates the isolation because people are traumatized. Same thing happens during a rape. Uh, that's also a doorway for the demonic. And then if the person gets involved in occult behaviors, that serves as the engine through which a, the, the, the demonic can attach themselves to the soul wound. And that's what I have to go and relieve the person of. So I'm going to give you a, a story now that recently happened to me that involved a young man uh, who lived here in my town in Saratoga while he was on a basketball scholarship to a local junior, a junior college, which is around the corner. And he was taking courses at this junior college. And it just so happened that the sociology course he was taking 
uh, they were using my book as one of the sources for the course. And I actually gave talks in that sociology course. I wasn't the teacher, but I was brought in to give a lecture on exorcism in the Catholic Church, etc. Well, this young man, he was 18 at the time. He lived in Brazil. He had a chance to join the national um, team in Brazil, but they coached him to go to the United States to get some further training, which would have made him more of a, an attractive candidate. So he went to the University of Miami. He got injured while he was there. And the coach at Miami suggested he go to a JC for a year or two and then go back to Miami. So when he started coming to visit me, it was, he said, because of the book. But then eventually he went back to Brazil. Father, you're froze there, so um, oh, we may have lost him. I think we lost him. Let's give him a chance to come on back to us here. Need to take a break now and be a real good time. Did I hear, did you guys pick up on that you can do an exorcist, exorcism uh, through Zoom? Did I hear that right? Long distance? Yeah. Okay, Robert, you give me a thumbs up. No, wow, I never, I never thought of that, that you could do an exorcist through Zoom. It was to another country, Gene. Yeah, but still, I mean, you're zooming, so you're doing this exorcism through the screen. Yeah. I find that fascinating. I mean, we do have prayer groups that meet, right? So you're, uh, most of what I think he was talking about, the deliverance thing is a, is a prayer thing. And if the person wants healing and they're open to what you're doing, I, I guess I could see it. I never heard of it before, though, that's for sure. Yeah, that, that's interesting. I have a question for him when he comes back on about, is he ever in physical danger that the demonic spirit turns its focus on him, either through a physical assault or whatever? Because it sounds initially like they're very skittish and they want to get out of there. They don't want to be, in, you know, like going into the pigs, the example, that uh, they recognize the authority and power and know they're in trouble. And if that's the case, why in the world do they first... Uh, want to come into the into your body what what's the advantage for them of that that's their job just to uh, irritate us <laughs> yeah drag us down actually monsignor uh, albaca used to be the exorcist for our our, our diocese at one Orange. time and it was actually it was it was uh, hidden nobody's supposed to know that from over at saint uh, uh uh, Cecilia's? Yes, it was St. Cecilia's, but he took his training back east in... Uh, yes, he did. Wherever it was, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Father Gary once told us that uh, every diocese has at least one uh, yes. exorcist in the form of our bishops, mm -hmm. and uh, that mo a lot of them have additional uh, exorcists like uh, Father Gary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I, I'm sure they get a bad rap from the TV. I mean, we, you know, my my vision of an exorcism is what, you know, the exorcist kind of thing. And to me, there seemed a very real uh, physical danger for the exorcist, the priest, that he could be, you know, physically injured, either something thrown at him or physically assaulted. Um, but One of our... Yeah, Monsignor Al said that most of these things are healings, just like uh, this priest was talking about. He said there's very, very few exorcisms. It's just people having difficult problems and they're just, uh, they get them through this time. So it's the demon just doesn't like the, uh, the spiritual uh, instruments, the cross, the holy water, that they really right. shun that. Yeah. Dean? Yes. You know, the interesting thing about uh, what you brought up related to the 
uh, use of, of uh, electronic uh, communication for an exorcism. Uh, what's terrifying to me is that we don't acknowledge often enough that the reverse is true as well. The amount of impact that television and uh, the internet has to introduce evil into uh, the homes and the minds of uh, young people and adults. Yeah. So, I mean, if uh, knowing that side of it, uh, knowing that God's power is greater than the evil uh, side, uh, it, it, it makes sense that, that it should work uh, that way as well. Thank God it does. Wow. Well, I, I can certainly see a lot of that work today in play. I mean, the vitriol, the, the language it's used, and focused at religion, too. I find that very interesting. You know, why, why target, particularly Catholics? Um, you know, you can be a radical. You can do whatever you want. But why are you fearful of us? Why do, why do we become the target? At least it seems like we're a target. I don't think there's any question about that, Gene. I think I think it's I think it's very apparent uh, when when you want to uh, present something as being uh, the symbol of Christianity or righteousness, that's where they go. They go to the Catholic Church, uh, and even Catholics do that. Even Catholic uh, filmmakers do that. Yeah, Hugh, you have a question. Is uh, Gary? Standing in the doorway, I see his name, but I. It, uh, no, I admitted him. I just admitted him. So here it is again, Wendy Tucker. But let's try this. No, I admitted him. He did pop up. He's connecting now. Audio. Gary, are you back with us, Father? He's muted. <laughs> no, he's not muted. I see his name here, and he's, it doesn't show he's muted. Who's Wendy Tucker? I don't know. Sure. He's gone again. He's gone again. Yeah, he is. He just dropped off again. Well, let's just continue with the so, discussion until we hopefully get him back on. So I'd love to add a little something there. Since one of the priests in our parish asked if I would, you know, be part of a prayer team for him as he was doing some of that kind of work, not the exorcist, but the the discernment and that kind of right. thing. And one thing that, that comes up and I'm sure Father uh, Thomas has to deal with it too is it takes a lot of preparation for him. He has to be careful, you know, not to get cocky with the, with the devils or demons mm -hmm. that they're looking for any opportunity to come back on you or hurt you somehow or fight back. And you have to be constantly in prayer and supported by people in prayer and forming yourself and not to push things too fast and to, you know, discern as accurately as you can, but to not feel like I can handle this one by myself, that kind of thing that he, they want a team. They want people with them, praying with them, observing with them, all that kind of thing. It has to do with just realizing, you know, this, these are powerful um, things that hate us. And that's the, it's just really something, it, it, especially even when he talks, he's speaking very calmly and rationally, but, but he's going to have to be very much protected as he attempts to deal with something like that. Even if well, the thank, person yeah. brings thank it you, to Joe. you. It became very clear to me that this is very much a phased process. You know, right. you first even determine, is this even a demonic possession or just a psychological issue or drugs involved or whatever the case may be? Right. And then to go through this discerning and, yeah, trust me, I would not want to be doing one of these on my own. I, I think the more... Hey, let, uh, let, me, let me talk to... Hey, uh, uh, Gene, I'm sorry to interrupt you, pal, but yeah. uh, Father's trying to get in and he says that uh, he's, he's not... Do, do you see him attempting to... I did at one time and I cleared him to come in. Uh, that's interesting. Tell him to try one more time and stay on. It'll take a few minutes, even though I clear him, it takes a few minutes to get in. While you're waiting, do you want to talk through my uh, uh, speakerphone to the group? Okay, let me put you on the speaker here, and uh, I'll put this all, uh, all right. Father, could you speak and see if they can uh, hear it through the, uh, the, the process here? Can you all hear me, folks? Yes, Father, we can yeah. hear you. All right, then let me, continue the, let me continue the talk. So 
I was talking about this young man in Brazil and um, the, I get an email from him and I, we probably email each other maybe once or twice a year. And I got this email from him a few months ago it was just at the beginning of COVID. And he said to me, my therapist said, I should contact you. He says, I'm, I'm really having a lot of suicidal thoughts. Well, when we actually uh, went on a Zoom call, which was like what we're doing today, unfortunately, I can't for some reason get back on. Um, he shared with me that in Brazil, they have a very high rate of what's called the practice of syncretism. And syncretism is the blending together of different religious traditions. And so... Um, I just got a sign here, unable to connect. Make sure you are connected to the internet and your connection to Zoom is not blocked by a firewall, firewall or proxy. Okay, I'm just gonna keep talking and um, um, we might have to just end this, uh, continue the meeting this way today. Um, so he went on to tell me that his brother and you his mother and father had been practitioners of, of a kind of synchronistic religion called Umbanda, U-M-B-A-N-D-A. -A. If you go on your Google, you can find Umbanda and all kinds of information about it. What it basically is, it's the channeling of human spirits. And Umbanda is a blending together of um, Catholicism mixed with indigenous practices of the natives from Brazil. And of course, because Brazil uh, was a uh, Portuguese colony, the Portuguese had gone and, and enslaved thousands of Africans and brought them over as slave labor uh, into the country of Brazil. And so they blended their own uh, superstitions with indigenous practices and Catholicism and came up with this Umbanda. Um, and so consequently, um, uh, consequently, this young man had been exposed for, uh, from the time he was two to um, this kind of pagan, kind of rituals whereby um, his mom would take him to a temple, an Ubanda temple, where there would be certain kinds of people, I would refer to them as mediums, their term was mother, and they, they would help people, even children, channel human spirits to tell them about their future. And these would be dead people, dead disembodied souls, and there holds a whole hierarchy. Well, as a result, this kid became very despondent because he'd been living a life of sin from the time he was old enough to, to understand right from wrong. When he was a child, it was a normal practice in his family to um, literally walk around the house in the nude to the mother, the father, the grandparents. Uh, he was an only child, his uncle, they would all walk around in the nude. And I said, well, at what point did you decide this was inappropriate? And he said about 15. He said it was not unusual for him, even at an older age, to sleep with his parents. And so he was very, very sexualized from the time he was a child. And so became very promiscuous around the time of 15. And he ended up having an affair with a woman who was twice his age. Uh, who was a mother, not in the sense of biological, but in the sense of being a, 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 an Umbanda mother, where through their intercourse, she would channel spirits for him. So when I, just, I said, for your homework, I want you to go home, and I want you to write down every single doorway you can recall, every single sexual liaison, every single Umbanda experience, and I want you to send it to me in an email. And then we're going to bind them all together, and I'm going to have you reject, renounce, and rebuke all of these practices and experiences, and we're going to see if we can liberate you. 
Well, when we did these, I did all these rejections, renouncings, and rebukings and severed all the ties. There were tremendous manifestations that were mostly in the form of the, the um, foaming at the mouth. There was no speaking in foreign languages. There was no inordinate strain. Now, this was all done by Zoom. But there was a tremendous amount of testing. Okay, Don, uh, what happened there? I think we lost. I, Don, you I, just got muted. Oh, Don, unmute yourself, Don. Yeah, when I let, there was two people wanting in, I let them in. And then I mute all, so you may have all got muted again. So if you want to be unmuted, just click your unmute there. Can you do that, Don, or do I need to do it for you? Don. I should be unmuted now. Yeah, yeah, you are. You're unmuted. Have, have, him, have him go back to the foaming at the mouth point. Yeah, Father, can you go back to the foaming at the mouth? We, we unfortunately muted everybody. Can, could you hear that, Father Gary? Um, he was coughing ex excessively. Uh, Father, Father, can I interrupt you a minute? Can, we, we lost you there for a period of time. Can you go back to the foaming of the mouth? That's, that's that where he is. I was just talking about that. Oh, that's I'm true. sorry. Go ahead. And so during these, these rejections, renouncing, and rebuking, and the severing of ties, there was a tremendous amount of foaming at the mouth, that was, I could see visually on the computer, and it had to do with him basically, I hate, I'm, for lack of a better word, it would be considered dry vomiting. But there was a lot of viscous sputum that he was coughing up. And this would go on, and this was not like the person normally has a cold and can clears their throat or whatever. This was going on for like a half an hour sometimes and then we'd get to the next severing and there'd be these over exaggerated yawns and i mean they just came out of nowhere but i've seen these before so i knew what was going on so we went we went through three sessions of this where we 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 bound together certain categories of his sins and in severing all of those ties we were able to get him off of alcohol we were able to get him off of marijuana. All of the suicidal thoughts went away. And all of a sudden, he began having a normal life again. And, and now he's, he's looking forward to the future that he had before this situation became uh, so dire, where he just became overwhelmed with, um, uh with with just this notion that his life was just spinning spinning out of control so i i share that with you because the um every case is different and there are very uh there's all kinds of very vague and largely unknown kinds of practices but that very much um are in the realm of paganism they're in the realm of the new age um, and these are people who are looking for answers and for power. And so my role, obviously, is, is to liberate, um, is to liberate people um, from these kinds of, um, from these kinds of, of, of spiritual play. Um, and so the, 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 you, when, you, when you see the prayers actually uh, work, um, it really does, it really does illustrate how powerful the right the, the rights of the church are and how powerful um this ministry can be and um in that regard it's been very transformational for me as a priest um, it's been very transformational for my team and obviously when a person has gone through uh this kind of ministry as the subject of these prayers, it's very transformational for them as well. And it's obviously brought a lot of people back to the faith. So I began my talk today by talking about exercise. Um, evil is not a metaphor. It's real. Satan is a creature. 
the, by the scriptures clearly articulate that. The whole reason for Jesus' uh, mission is to defeat Satan, sin, and death. The moment he dies on the cross, his mission is fulfilled. He becomes the perfect sacrifice that we celebrate at Mass every time, every day. And it is in that perfect sacrifice that the cross and um, salvation are tied together because the cross serves as the bridge between heaven and earth. Thank you. Father, uh, we're, and ladies and gentlemen, we're going we're gonna to add some more time on here. We had so many delays, and I know a number of you have uh, questions. Uh, Father, when you were off, we, we did have a couple of questions, and I'd like to start with one as far as, are you ever in physical danger from this uh, malevolent spirit? I mean, do they all of a sudden turn their focus on you as, as the person trying to get rid of them, and they're going to try to take you out? D does that occur? Yeah, well, I, I've had several occasions when I've, I've been taken out, but yes, it's dangerous, but that's one of the reasons you have a team. You have a team present in, in part to protect me, to protect the emergument. That's the title of the client. That's the term given to the client. Um, and so I've had several cases where I've been attacked. In one case, I had a, a demon part of the ritual, and, and this was during a formal. And you lay hands and you blow on the person's face. It's called the rite of evolution. It's very similar to when Jesus breathed on the disciples and, and, and told them, you know, uh, receive the Holy Spirit whose sins you forgive are forgiven them, whose sins you retain are retained. Um, and so when I blew into the face of the subject of the emergument, the demon blew back in my face. And when he blew back in my face, actually twice, I should have been prayed over immediately by the team. Um, I wasn't, and we learned a lot from that. And so um, we did pray at the end, like we normally do, to, to, to find any demons or anything demonic that hadn't been found before. We cleansed the church spiritually. We went home. I woke up the next morning with a very severe stomach ache. Although I celebrated Mass, I had a bunch of appointments in the morning. I had a wedding at 2 o'clock. At the Lord's Prayer, in the middle of the wedding Mass, I got very faint. I asked the um, seminarian who was with me to get me a glass of water. When he brought me the water, um, by the time he brought me the water, I was just to the point of saying, Behold the Lamb of God. I consumed the Eucharist, and I fell over. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, I had to be revived, although it wasn't for very long. And then I completed the rest of the Mass, and then I had to go to the emergency because the family had called the ENTs. They took me off in an ambulance, um, they couldn't find anything wrong with me, but I had Montezuma's revenge literally all night long. And I was laid up for about two days. Wow. And I went to see my doctor, and he knows that I'm involved in this ministry. He's a practicing Catholic. He said, well, I think you had a, you had a virus. I said, no, I had a demonic attack. And so um, that's one situation. Another situation where I've had demons using, using the vessel of the body come lunging at me, uh, to try and do me physical harm, but I've never actually been in any, I've never actually been the, the object of any actual harm, but I've had demons that have lunged at me a number of times uh, in order to try and attack me. So yeah, there, there are dangers, but you know, I know that Christ is present and his mother is present and I just really, I have no, I just have no fear and it's not cockiness or brazenness. It's just, I have no fear. Father, do you, do you ever actually physically see an apparition or a vision leaving the body when it's expelled? No, but no, I, I've never seen that. Now, I have several discerners on my team who can see spirits. But what, I, what you do see and what I do see is I see the release. I, see the, I do see the body's own body language contorting in a way as if it's, 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 being prepared, uh, there's kind of a point where, like, if you think of a wave, and as the wave begins to crest, that's exactly what happens when you cast and the demonic leave. There is a kind of point where there's a, it reaches a point of cresting, and then there's kind of a, not so much a lunging, but there's the body kind of moves forward. It kind of, 
comes forward and and out of usually through the mouth because demons leave through the orifices orifices they 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 enter through the eyes the nose the mouth and um, the ears they enter through the senses normally demons will leave usually by the mouth although sometimes by the anus but usually by the mouth at least and we usually try to d direct them to leave by the mouth we'll tell them that We'll just say in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and demand you leave this person through their mouth. Um, I've picked up on kind of your comments that there, there may be a, a perceptible profile of a person that that would be more vulnerable. Someone who has probably no faith or uh, no. maybe a, a poor upbringing. Um, well, those could be variables, but those are not. Those would not be slam dunks that would say because a person has no faith, are they more vulnerable? Yes. But you really have to kind of invite the demonic in. So when people get involved in the occult, what they're doing is whether they conscious, and sometimes they don't consciously mean this, what they're doing is they're creating a relationship. And demons and a possession is a relationship. So demons are always looking for people with no relationships or broken relationships, which is why they sexual abuse is such a soul wound. But if a person has no faith, um, they, I wouldn't say they're more likely, but I would say that without a faith optic, and even people who are baptized Catholics oftentimes are involved in these kinds of things, because they may not have a faith optic either, even as a baptized Christian or Catholic. Um, it's the person who really has no faith. It is not so much the, the, the person who who is not baptized it's the person who really whose own faith optic is very thin and it does not understand the dangers of making attempts to to uh, you know make contact with um, with the dark side wow. brother brothers any other questions out there uh, Ray, yes do you have a question yes I have are there recurrences of uh, demonic repossessions? And if so, what would have caused the repossession? Good question. In the 12th, that's a good question. In, in, the, in the 12th chapter of Matthew, let me open it for you. In the 12th chapter of St. Matthew, let me go there. Um, there's a very, very good reference to how demons can... Um, find their way back. Let me go there. Hold on. Um, one second. Um, just had it here a second ago. In the 12th chapter, okay. Um, okay. Um, Wait a minute here, I just had it here, hold on a second. Um, Twelve twenty-two. <coughs> um, starting, starting with verse twenty-two? No, hold on. Um, oh yeah, here it is. Verse forty-three. Oh, Chapter okay. twelve. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, it wanders through waterless country looking for a place to rest and cannot find one. Then it says, I will return to the home I came from. But on arrival, finding it unoccupied, that's a very key word I'll explain in a minute, swept and tidied. It then goes off and collects seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they go in and set up house there so that the man ends up being worse than when he was before, that it will happen to this evil generation. So what happens, what that, what that what it means when the house is unoccupied, it means God is not present. So if a, if a person is liberated from intelligent, evil beings we call demons, if they don't stay, in the grace of God, if they don't stay in the regiment of prayer, if they don't 
maintain a sacramental life, the demons will come back sevenfold, finding it unoccupied. In other words, finding it empty of grace, swept and tidied, unoccupied, swept and tidied. It's empty. If God is not, if God is not full of that person's, in a sense, their temple or their house, which is what our, our body is. It's a temple or a house of the Holy Spirit. Um, the demons will come back sevenfold, and I've had that happen, where I've had at least one person. We spent four years trying to completely liberate him because he didn't listen to what we said, and he wouldn't comply with what we our directions. And the demons came back seven times worse than when we were first with him. Thank you, Father. Any other questions? I have a question for Father Gene. Go ahead, Don. Father Gary, uh, you started off, and you, you told me this story yesterday about the head of the um, Society of Jesus who uh, made the statement about uh, faith being a uh, metaphor. Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a story that I sent you uh, just about uh, 20 minutes ago, and I sent it out to some of the other people in the Friars about an Episcopalian, uh, the head the head bishop for the Episcopalian Church made a speech down in Venezuela back in 2013, where she made the statement that the story of St. Paul um, uh, exercising the demon from the slave girl who, who made uh, predictions about the future and her masters uh, made money from her, that this, this bishop of, the head bishop of the Episcopalian Church of America said, that this was clearly an example of uh, St. Paul not understanding that this young woman had a relationship with the divine through this demon and that it was his own ego that kept him from being able to see the beauty of that relationship. Now, that's, that's oh, of course it is. But my question is this, with this type of thing, uh, uh, you know, these, these types of statements being made, as lay people, what would you suggest that we do in these situations where we see something like this as we're dealing with our brothers and sisters in Christ, other than pointing out the error of this and praying for each other, is there anything else that you would suggest that we do? Honestly, not really. I mean, you know, these, these articles get on the internet, and I mean unless you want to make a comment to this misguided bishop, there really isn't, there really isn't much. I don't think there's much one can do. It's the same thing with, you know, if I was to write to the Holy Father, I don't even know if he'd get the letter, you know, expressing a protest. Now, I do know the International Association of Exorcists in Rome. I know they, they filed a formal complaint against him because I happen to be a member of the International Association of Exorcists. So, and they're a pontifical organization, so they're recognized by the Vatican. And Pope Francis actually was the one who made them a pontifical organization, which I'm grateful for. And they filed a formal complaint against uh, the comments made by the Superior General. I don't know where they ever went, but I did get notification of it because it came in the form of a letter addressed to all of us from the president of the International Association of Exorcists, Father Francesco Belmonte. And... Um, but I, it's hard. I mean, it, a year or two ago, the Episcopal Church um, in England, the Anglican Church in England, changed the rite of baptism so that it no longer had any reference in the in the uh, in the renewal of baptismal promises to include the, to include Satan. Uh -huh. So it no longer says, "Do you renounce Satan and all his works and all his empty promises?" It no longer says that. And the reason that, and I read this article, if you. Google that in, it'll probably come up somewhere. They they're trying to they're trying to quote unquote be relevant for today's culture. Well, you're <laughs> not being relevant by basically denying the existence of personified evil because that's heretical. It's found in the scriptures, and and we we clearly believe that that Lucifer, whose name it was before he became Satan, the Hemus Aquinas believes and teaches that the angels saw the entire, the entire course of salvation. And when they saw God embracing incarnation, 
That's when Lucifer and a third of the angels rebelled in heaven. That's found in the 12th chapter of Revelation. And they rebelled and they rebelled against the incarnation because they would then have had to give homage and glory to the God man. And because human beings are below the nature of angels, the angels would have then had to do God and the God man's bidding, which meant that human beings, though they are of a lower nature than us, they would have had God who was incarnate, which would have been above them. And that's why Lucifer re, re, uh, rebelled. And it was over jealousy and envy. And Lucifer wanted to be on par with God. And he couldn't be because God is divine. And, and Lucifer is a, is, a, is, a, is a creature. He's a created being made by God. He can't be on, on par with God. He can't. It's not possible. And so that's why you have the, that's why Christ, that's why you have the whole story of Jesus Christ and his incarnation, which is Christmas. Why all that happens? Why you have his death and resurrection, the Paschal mystery? Because it's to save the world, for, to atone for sin. And Christ is the perfect sacrifice to atone for our sins that gives us a gateway back to heaven, which we had, which we owned and had been given by our creation before the fall of Adam and Eve and lost it. And so that's why we call Mary the new Eve, because she said yes to cancel out Eve's no. When Eve was seduced by the serpent who was manifested as Satan himself. Well, Father, thank you. That was amazing. Fascinating, actually. Um, it, it's interesting how many people say they believe in God, but don't believe in the devil. Well, how can you believe in one without the other? Uh, but your insight was very, very helpful, dispelled a lot of uh, what, we, what we learned from Hollywood. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, there's no further questions. I want to thank uh, Father Thomas for his time uh, and the difficulty we had. Father, I'm sorry about that, but it still came across. It was very helpful. So, Please accept our thank yous for a job well done. And um, we learned quite a bit. So with that, uh, thank you. I'm, I'm, Let's... I'm, so welcome. I'm grateful to have been invited on. During the time I was talking, I was still using uh, the pass numbers, the passcode to get back in. And I couldn't, and my, my, my computer is working fine, so I don't, I don't know if it's the Zoom um, or with you, the Zoom with you or what, but I'm... Well, I'm going to pass it off that it was the devil. <laughs> <laughs> he was interfering with us, so he didn't want that message out there. I, I, I can't say that something like that couldn't happen, but, you know, I'm just glad that we were able to still have this. And I, I hope, despite the fact that you, they weren't able to see me, that they could hear the answers to my questions and that they could hear the questions being articulated. We, we could, Father. You actually were very clear. It, it was very well, uh, came across very well. So, uh, How about a closing blessing? Yeah, yeah. Father, I think it would be more appropriate if you gave us a blessing than any of us uh, other folks here. Would you mind doing that, please? I would be very happy to. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And gracious God, we give you thanks and praise for bringing the first Friday Friars together this afternoon and for my opportunity to be able to speak to them and also to, to really provide information and a teaching on a very important topic of our faith life. And Lord, as well, we just ask that the first Friday Friars continue to be successful as a group and that even despite this COVID, that this will provide a great solidarity for this group of Catholics to remain close together, close at hand, and as well to be able to have their faith fostered more deeply and to keep us all pleased in good health, free of COVID, and to bring about a, a vaccine very soon. And as well, please over help us overcome the tremendous amount of confusion and tumult that exists in our world. And Lord, please strengthen our church and certainly the Roman Catholic Diocese of Orange and my own Diocese of San Jose at this time. And we ask all of this in prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And may Almighty God bless you all. 
attached to First Friday Friars, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. Thank you very much. I promise you, that was Father. very, very much appreciated. And All thank right, you, Don. And gentlemen, um, thank you for hanging in there with us. I know a little longer, but this was good stuff. And uh, I'll tell you what, it, it really makes you think and reflect. And uh, you, we kind of go, at least I do, I go through my daily prayers and uh, with my wife. And boy, does this give new focus to that? Because really, that's your armor. You're putting on your armor every day. And make no mistake, every day we are at war uh, from all sides. So uh, I want to thank you uh, for the board. Don't forget, we'll have a meeting uh, this next Friday at 1. I'll get that word out to you all. Uh, but other than that, have a blessed weekend and a wonderful week. And uh, say a lot of prayers for our, our country and our president. Any chance we can I meet? would like to invite other people to join the board meeting this coming Friday. You want to invite other people? I think so. Well, that, that, that we're open if the, if you have a lot, of time, now. a lot of time on your hands. Come on and join us. One o'clock. We'll have a yes, uh, Deacon Jim. Deacon, send, Jim send, me a, send me a thing. So I can get on. What? I don't know. Oh, okay. Anybody else? Yeah. Maybe it's a doctor's report. No, that's yeah, well, you, it's an open invitation. You're free to join. We we just kind of basically recap well, what we've done, where we're going, and uh, get good dialogue. So please, if you feel like one to have two cents, join us. And that, uh, the, Denny, you'll have to put that board meeting notice out to everybody then. Yeah. What's okay. The I see Marianne shaking her head. That's really who I'm talking second. to. It'll be the ninth. Yes, the ninth. That's correct. One o'clock on the ninth. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Have a blessed weekend. And uh, Don, thank you so much. That was a great, great speaker. That was excellent. Take care, everybody. All righty. Take good care. Good night. Good, good day, I should say. It's not <laughs> night yet. <laughs>